Let's talk about some max strength training. We're going through some of the phases of NASM's optimum performance training model. And phase number four in the current program as it exists is maximal strength training. Not a lot of clients, patients, and athletes are going to need this unless you're in an area uh, such as a strength coach or working with athletes on a regular basis that need to produce max strength. But we're going to be working with 85 to 100 percent of our approximate one rep max. We're going to be doing anywhere between one to five repetitions. This is closer to a powerlifting type protocol, usually focusing on multi-joint exercises. Barbells are frequently used so we can focus on mass, um, I'm sorry, force production. We're resting complete for a complete recovery in between each set, between three and five minutes. The smaller muscle groups will need closer to that three minute recovery, uh, the moderate around four, and then the larger around five. So for example, you do a heavy full on set of squats for four or five reps, you're gonna need close to that five minutes to recover completely with the legs you're doing a set of chest, a comparatively smaller muscle group, you might be ready to go in three and a half minutes or so. So we're making sure that we're recovered because we're focusing on executing a specific number of reps, almost like a power lifter would. We're, we're setting clear targets and goals on moving a weight for X number of repetitions. So we want to be refreshed and recharged, have full ATP stores ready to go. Barbell squat, um, barbell row, uh, deadlift, cleans, pulls, snatches, you think about it, with a barbell, you can use dumbbells as well, but it's out there. We want to go ahead and recruit the largest muscle fibers possible, the type 2X muscle fibers, and they will not fire unless we give them a significant load or teach the nervous system how to fire them quickly. So here we're again focusing on the overload principle, lifting a heavier weight so our body kind of overcomes that size principle. The size principle dictates that we're only going to stimulate the smallest number of muscle fibers possible to complete a task. Think of the law of conservation. It doesn't know that we have a cafe here in the health club or um, food in the fridge or McDonald's on every corner or Dunkin' Donuts in every corner up here around Boston. It doesn't know that. We're still basically focusing on 10,000 year old genes. It's trying to save everything that we have and not waste it. So it's not going to use the large muscle fibers unless, number one, we have the stability and control and alignment to protect the joint. And that's why we work up to this phase and don't start in this phase. But unless that we given this um, a load significant enough or give the body a good enough reason to provide that uh, activation of those motor units that are going to control the type 2x muscle fibers. We're trying to produce as much force as possible. That the speed, it's explosive, but if you think about a near one rep max, the body's not going to move very fast. And the one to five reps, you can use more of a traditional uh, linear, linear periodization with this going, doing an ascending or descending pyramid through one workout or an ascending or descending pyramid over weeks. So you could have five reps in week one, four reps in weeks two, three reps. It goes all the way down. So there, there are many different types of training, whether it's hip tra hit training or specific powerlifting protocols that can fit somewhere within the OPT model. This is a good example of more traditional powerlifting types of exercises. Who is going to need this? Uh, football players, wrestlers, some baseball players. I know some dancers, if you've seen some live dance performances up close, ballet dancers, they need maximal strength. Now I'm not talking right about in the middle in the middle of their Broadway show, they've got a 12 week run of Grease. We're not doing max strength training with them, but in their off season, in between shows, can be an important part of that. We're not trying to overtrain everyone. That's why the concept of periodization is so important, that we're finding out where someone uh, should start based on their needs, goals, wants, and abilities, and we're drawing a program to get them where they want to go so they can operate at the highest level of performance, at the highest level, or an optimal level, if you would, uh, when they need to do that. So when we're talking about phase four, apply it judiciously, uh, focusing on max strength, obviously teaching someone good coordination and good control first. You want to have minimized muscular imbalances. You want to have good core stability, good joint alignment. So when people are walking in like this and they're doing heavy bench presses, they're just waiting for a shoulder or neck problem. So when I'm talking about shoulder problem, whether it's impingement, bursitis, tendonitis, or otherwise, but because of the relationship between the musculature and the cervical spine and the shoulder complex, we could be looking at disc injuries and aggravations and at the minimum a headache with these sternocleidomastoids getting overactive. There's a guy at my gym, every time he benches, he does this. He says such poor stability through a sternoclavicular joint that his sternocleidomastoid goes on a lockdown like this. And we know that any time that there's flexion or extension in the spine, um, at that end range of motion, you're going to increase intradiscal pressure. So yes, you can lead to disc, uh, disc problems in the neck with heavy bench presses with the head and shoulders not aligned or moving correctly. 
That's why I have to spend so much time grooving mo motor patterns, improving stability, improving joint mobility, um, working with core balance, reactive training exercises, working up um, the concept of planned fitness training or periodization to get someone to this point. And then once someone summons at this point, staying here a month, month and a half, two months, half a month, that we're not overtraining. Many of the athletes that I see, they start to move better and feel better and looser and they get stronger than they've ever been and more powerful than they've ever been. And then if they go away from training with me, they go off to school or wherever it may be, that's when they start to break down because they stay in these types of phases for too long because they feel so good. They never come all the way back down and recover. This can be a fun way to train. It can be gratifying for clients to attach a number to something. Uh, it can be very helpful for specific athletes um, for their sport health and fitness applications, not as many common applications, but sometimes you've been training someone for a year or two and you want to give them a specific to number to go for, hey, have some fun. Give themselves a goal. Have them kind of move towards it. But um, NASM's information on their uh, third edition personal training text covers this a little bit more. And just think about the flexibility that you have in designing a program here. Well, max strength training can be a very powerful and fun way to um, put a program together. I'm Eric Beard. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.